Sean, you look like an investor. Um, how many baseball fans do we have here? How many Giants fans do we have here? Me as well. It's an even year. Could be a really special year once again. They're trying to get five rings in ten years so they can fill up uh, one full hand. How many VC fans do we have here? It's good to have a few of you guys. Well, I'm the VC fan at least most of the time. Do you know what VCs and baseball hitters have in common? That's a good guess. Any anything else? The ER. Uh, well, it, to, there's probably a lot of other similarities, but I'd say the most common similarity would be a 30% success rate is considered. Jumping in before you're ready and relating that to product market fit. I'm Sean Jacobson of Norwest Venture Partners. We're the second oldest venture firm in the country, 55 years old. I, I focus on the enterprise cloud space, mostly A and B rounds, but I do like getting to know entrepreneurs earlier than that. And uh, most of my career has been in operating roles. So over the last 15 years, most of my career has been in operating roles where I ran sales and or business development. Two of the companies I joined in the A round are now successful public companies. And I'll allow Michelle to introduce herself. Sure, um, and uh, if Sean is the investor, I'm, I'm more of the on playing the role of entrepreneur for internet property. So websites, apps, blogs, they sign up for Cloudflare and we make sure that they're fast around the world and we're protected from a range of online cyber attacks. And when we started six years ago, a lot of people thought we were crazy. Um, and today now, again, we have 4 million customers using Cloudflare. At any given second, about 10% of internet traffic is using Cloudflare to be fast and safe around the world. And so um, when Sean asked whether I do this today, I'd say, sure, I'd love to come and help share some of my experiences early on and what worked for us to get our business going um, to help all of you build big companies. You mentioned that when you started the company, a lot of people thought you were crazy. But there's one person that thought you were crazy who didn't mention. She she started this Cloudflare at Harvard Business School, won the business plan competition, but at the same time, she had an offer from LinkedIn where there were only 200 people. And that was a tough decision for you. It, it, it maybe seems obvious now, but it was not that obvious at the time. But the hiring manager, uh, you, you had said, had said, this may be the biggest mistake in your life. I think that's right. I was at business school. The goal of going to business school is to get a good job after. So I worked really hard my whole time to get a good job after. And I had gotten this offer to go to LinkedIn, which back in 2009 was not the size it was today. It was much, much earlier, much smaller. And it would have been a great, great opportunity. But then we started to work on Cloudflare as a school project. And, and we had a like little bit of traction. I mean, we didn't have a product, we had no customers. I just kind of felt this falling in love with the idea more and more. And I remember moving out here and telling um, my potential manager at LinkedIn, hey, thanks so much. This is a really hard decision, but I, I'm not going to come join LinkedIn. I'm going to go and try to do my, my, my own thing. And he said, you're making the biggest mistake of your life. And I think for 99.9% of scenarios, he probably was right. You know, now, again, seven years later, I think things have turned out just fine. Either would have been a good option, but um, I mean, what he was trying to say is, this is kind of like the Sheryl Sandberg, uh, um, Eric Schmidt conversation of, if you're offered a seat on the rocket ship, get on. Doesn't matter which seat you're offered. This is what Eric Schmidt once said to Cheryl way back when, when she was looking for a job, because she was trying to optimize everything. He said, Google's a rocket ship, just get on, and we'll figure things out. And I think that's what Wixon was trying to tell me, and again, it was a rock ship for a company, um, but for whatever reason, a little bit crazy, decided to do my own thing. It has led a lot of startups to spending too much money in sales and marketing before they are actually ready. I can think of one example of a company I know that raised $10 million at $100 million valuation. They had some really good traction, but they were only selling to, to friends and fellow tech companies. They would have scored low on points one, two, and four here. They blew through the 10 million in a year and were out of business. So we're going to make this a fairly interactive 
working session. So I'd like each of you to score yourself along these five different criteria. We'll be going through each point one at a time. Add up your scores, and then we'll tell you where you are with respect to product market fit today, and then you'll have an idea of which of these areas you really want to push further on to increase your overall score. I'll also be interviewing Michelle in each of these criteria at two points in time. Uh, one point in time will be when she raised her Series B, which really is equivalent to a Series A in today's terms. Because their A was technically a two, two million dollar round, which most, in most cases would be a C today. So at the point you raised your Series B, how did you rate yourself in each of these areas? And then, uh, what did you do in each of these areas to increase your score as of today? So, the first point, diversity of customers. I think this, this is probably the area where people have the most confusion and assume they fit product market fit when they haven't. Uh, i give you one example of a company that I talked to and they said 30% of their incubator class are customers and trying to raise funding on that. I've also seen a lot of people say, well, you know, I've, I've sold to a lot of fellow tech companies and friends. They don't, they, they may not realize that it's just friends or friends of investors or friends of friends. And those people will test out products and won't necessarily give you the right feedback. Um, so my one rule I say is if it works in Des Moines, it'll probably work here. If it works here, it probably, it may not work in Des Moines. So Michelle, uh, when you raised your B round, how did you rate yourself and why? So um, when I think about customers really early on, our customers do have to own a domain to use Cloudflare. So like, well, you know, if you're a consumer, you can't use my service. So the first thing to ask yourself is, who's your customer? And for us, it was you had to have a website um, or an app. And so that meant I was talking to a lot of webmasters early on. Um, and when we raised our B, we definitely were the third one. Um, and a couple of things we did that I'll just share that might be helpful to all of you. So we, so so again, my customer segment were website owners, so a lot of sysadmin, webmaster, super technical crowd. Um, and our promise was to help make their domains faster and safer. That's what our value proposition to them was. And before Cloudflare came along, they had very few options. And so I remember doing a survey to our to this set of customers, asking them, what do you use for performance today? What do you use for security? What do you, like, do you even care about these problems? And the survey results were the, the uh, they were so good, I could not, it was almost like I made them up. I, they're, they're, they're just, there's clearly a huge problem there. So I would get responses like, and I didn't know any of these people, I'd get responses like, uh, web spammers make me believe in the death penalty. So huge conviction that there was a real problem from the customer set segment, and over and over, uh, they, you know, they were like, most members are the earth of the world, they steal resources, and they're criminals, they should be in jail. Like, really, really strong, passionate. Uh, and then when I said, well, what we're you using to solve the problem, nobody had was using the same thing. They're all homegrown solutions. And so for us, this was conviction early on. I'm like, oh, we could, if we can solve this in an elegant way, there might be a big problem, like a big opportunity here. And, and so that's kind of how we approached it. And so how did we get customers all over the world that just weren't in the valley? Um, well, we did a couple different things. So, and again, just because we did it doesn't mean you should do it. I'm just sharing kind of how we thought about it. We got an email list really early on of web spammers, of, web, of webmasters, uh, through something called Project Honeypot. And basically, these people were opting into this open source project to track web spammers online. If they care about web spammers, they probably care about being protected from them. Right, so it was like a really high match. So early on, we kind of used that list um, to see our business. And then we did something called, we launched a TechCrunch Disrupt, which is a big um, event that's twice a year, once in San Francisco, once in New York. Uh, for us, it was great because 
people who are looking for the next generation from around the world could be popular customers. And so from that, a lot of people signed up, and then we have this stock growing since. And we've done some, a lot of other smart things, partnerships to help drive that. But it really comes down to like who are your customers, and then how do you find high overlap with that? And that's kind of some of the things that we did. So we were we we were always very from very early on. We had people. We had the opposite problem. Nobody in San Francisco knew who we were and did not use our service. But everyone else outside of San Francisco did. So that's where we started very early on. Because early on is so hard. If all of you are like feel like every day you're up against like challenges, that's normal. But everyone else feels the same way, and you're just constantly trying to make progress. And so early on, we started with this free plan and twenty dollar a month plan. And it was great because it really opened up the market. Nobody was talking to that segment of the market at all, so we opened up the market, which again I think helps helped us grow very early on as we as we as we have got the word out. Um, over time, what happened were larger and larger customers came to us and said, "Hey, we want to use Cloudflare, but I have to pay you more than twenty dollars a month." Like, there's just no way that I can use your service for 20 dollars a month. Like, I will get fired if I do that. And so we got getting pulled up the market of saying, businesses want to use Poplar and they need a more business ready or enterprise ready service. Okay? And that took us over two years to get there. So just to put these things into context. So, so we started with this free $20 a month plan. And then over time, we've, we've, we've gone more and more up market. As a business owner, there's lots of research that has shown this is true. It's much easier to start kind of low end and go up than start charging a million dollars and come down. And a lot of businesses go uh, get disrupted, which is a very overused term, because they, they charge high prices and try and come down. It's very hard. Um, and so anyway, so we started low and went up. You know, what I often get a lot of like, why do you guys have a free service? And there's a lot that's been written on premium businesses and self-serve businesses. So premium businesses, you have a free plan just to try to upsell them to a paid plan. In my opinion, that's not a very good business. It's and a lot, and, and if you go read online, it's, it's a really hard thing. Investors don't like it, and it's because lots of people have tried it, and there's lots of research that shows it, the economics don't work very well. The reason why we have a free service is we get a lot of value out of it that helps the overall service even make makes it even better. So I'll just give you a couple of examples, and again, you have to think to yourself if you have a free service for your product. Why else do I have a free service? Not just to try and not sell a new paid plan, because a good conversion on a premium business is two to five percent, and lots of businesses have tried this. So you're not going to have a higher than a five percent, maybe it'll be six percent, but but you can't. And so so why would why does Cloud have a free service then? So we crowdsource all the threat data. So we love our free customers because they help give us more insight into who who are the um, attackers online, and we use that intelligence to sell it to large enterprises you know, at that hundred thousand dollar price point. Okay, and so that's one reason why we have a free service. Um, and there's some other there's five reasons actually, but there and they add other value to business. So ask yourself if you think you're having a free service, is there something else you can get out of those free customers besides just trying to get them paid? And if the answer is yes, you have a really eloquent, articulate way to articulate it, then you're that. Then that might be a good strategy for you. If the answer is, well, I'm just trying to, you know, get them in so I can convert them. There are other ways. Do trials. Do 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 um, caps. There's other things you can do to help make that happen. Yeah, so I do. do I, 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 see the I, I definitely agree with that. I, I think freemium is really tough to do in the enterprise market. Freemium works better in the consumer world because every consumer in the world is a potential customer. In the enterprise market, there's not enough enterprises where you know three to five percent conversion generates a good business. Based on a happy and healthy customer. And so how far are you from that or not? I can think of you know one one product that that you know typically has very high engagement is Salesforce. So for salespeople, it's your system of record. They live and breathe out of it. They spend three to four hours a day in the product. So if you rip that out, that would be pretty disruptive to their business. You know, some other products out there don't require that level of engagement for you to be considered a you know a great product. But um, but you have to start somewhere, you know. And sometimes you're not going to get to that highest level of gain from the start, but that should be your aspiration. So Michelle, your B round. 
how did you rate yourself here and, and what have you done since then? Uh, you know, it's so funny. The, the, we used to discuss this in Berlin when we were a lot earlier. Uh, we had a disagreement in Berlin. Uh, Matthew, who's my business partner, he was fine with people signing up for Cloudflare and never using it. And I said, no, no, no. We want to build a product that people use. And we kind of had a disagreement and it, it wasn't clear. He's like, it's, you know, he's like, um, if they set it and forget it, that's a perfectly good business too. Um, and so there was a lot of disagreement internally um, early on. Uh, the, the way that I characterize this, and, and again, early on we obsessed over this, is are you building up something of value to your customers? Do they care that you are around? Um, and if you can, if, if, if they hate you, that's actually a good thing too, because at least they like, care. <laughs> Um, in the negative way, you can go and address why. Uh, but if they are indifferent, if you exist, I think that's the worst place to be. And so early on, we spent a lot of time talking to people, trying to make sure that we were solving the real problem that they had. So I told you we did this survey. I do, uh, I do hear some people say, hey, Sean, I only have 4% of my churn. That sounds so bad, is it? And, you know, deep inside, I feel like that is pretty bad. You know, it may be okay in the early days, because you may be at such a low revenue level that even to lose 50% of your revenue each year, you can still make it up and continue to grow. But at some point in time, it is really hard to continue to grow if you're losing 50% of your revenue each year. And um, so, you know, churn is, is a good way for you to identify what might be going wrong. You know, like I said, you're pricing, service, competition, there's a variety of things that it could be related to. But the right churn depends on who your target customer is. So I'd say for enterprise customers, uh, if that's your focus, and that, you know, for instance, Cornerstone on Demand, where I work, that was our focus. You know, our goal was to be at 5% annual revenue churn. And that doesn't include any upsells. That's just based on the revenue we have today. And I'd say anything you know within you know 10% of your churn and focus on enterprise is, is pretty good. Because that means with upsells and expansions, you could probably get to 110% revenue retention. When you're focused on S and B customers, it's pretty hard to get there because a lot of S&D customers, you know, will go out of business, um, get acquired. There's a lot of things outside your control that will uh, will involve some churn. So um, I'd say with S&D focused customers, if you can get under 20% a year annual churn, that's, that's pretty good. Ideally, you want to try to get less than that. That should be the outer end of your goal. You're not going to get there in the earliest days, but that's your goal to get there. And there's obviously a lot of businesses that have a, a mix of those two types of uh, customers and you have to kind of just factor in what, what is healthy for your business and allow you to grow at a healthy clip. So Michelle, the, you know, at your B round, how did you think about yourself? And, and maybe this this isn't necessarily relevant for you guys, but it was. Oh, it was. When we were at our B round, when we raised money, we were number one. We weren't measuring churn. We were really early. We didn't know. We were more growing. We were focused on the growth. Now, of course, we look at that a lot more closely. And for our self serve business, we're at the second point. And our enterprise business, we're on the third point. Because we have two different points, types of business. Our self serve is much more SMB. So it's like a real like, case study of what Sean's talking about. The, um, you know, the way that we characterize this is, uh, if you're a SaaS business, like when people are paying you a subscription fee, you really care about three things. You care about getting customers, okay? And so each of you early on is making sure that you a product and solving a real problem to get customers. Then you want to keep your customers so that you're doing a delivery on your promise and there's lots of different reasons why you might not keep them. And then, how do you sell more of your existing customers? Like, that's the formula. Those are what great companies are built on in the, in the SaaS space. And so, um, early on, it's very much about how do you acquire customers. And then at some point, you're like, okay, let's keep acquiring customers, but also make sure we're keeping the ones that we're getting. And, and, and your job as entrepreneurs is hopefully to delay that a little bit. Because hopefully you're getting so many customers 
and things are going so well, you're growing so quickly, they don't have to worry about churn really early on. Because mm -hmm. um, if you're worrying about churn really early on, it means like, the product, like there's a lot, you probably haven't actually solved your whole problem quite yet. And then, and then it's, okay, now now that we are getting customers and we're keeping them, how do we start selling, how do we start offering more to the, our current customers? And that's Crowded spaces, uh, enterprises <clears throat> are still trying to decide what solution will solve their problem. So I've seen a lot of times where five companies in a space will come and pitch me, and they all have some of the same customer logos on their website or on their slide deck. And then I, you know, call these companies and I say, Well, I see you're you're using five or six different vendors to solve this problem and they say yeah you know we're going to test them all for a year and then decide next year which one we're going to commit to so uh, i think one case where ge was paying you know five companies between five and ten thousand a year and yeah that's a great low but five to ten thousand a year for ge is just you know testing budget so for me as a vc i need to you know figure out which products are really going to take off longer term and sometimes that's that's hard, and, and you might get some you may get some feedback in the market thinking that you're onto something when you really are not, because you know all your competitors are getting the same logos. I mean, you have to be in the mix there. But how do you separate yourself? How do you be that product they use in the second year? So Michelle, in the in your um, you know at your B round, at, you know how did you rate yourself and why? So we were okay. So um, another way to save pilot programs are betas or private betas, and I love private betas. Uh, we ran a really, really extensive private beta early on, and it helped make our product a lot better. It gave us kind of a cover to talk to our customers, get that feedback, and kind of be embarrassed in a quiet way. I guess is another way to say because you really are embarrassed early on by what you're offering to your customers. Uh, but we learned a lot during that period. And so when we were interviewed, we were the second one. We, we were just doing month to month. We had no, I mean, and that, that was just it. Um, uh, again, today we signed multi-year deals and, 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 and whatnot. But um, the, a couple things on here. So why do I like private betas? Well, I like it because if you tell, if you have someone type of beta, their expectation is that things are going to break. Right? And their expectation is they're going to help you find those things. So it's a great way to find some initial users who will help make your product better. And then again, if your job is to listen and to get these like nuggets, then you can go use that to like you know recruit or embed that, find investors or whatnot. You can move that in some different ways. You're basically in a conversation with a small set of people. We built a, we did our product data up to a thousand websites. So we kind of we did one for the first hundred, which was so hard to get to the first hundred customers. I used to have a board. And every day I would color in how many people we added. And when we got to 100, we said we were going to take the company to Vegas. It took us months to get to our first 100 customers. And then we took the company to Vegas, all five of us. It was really, really fun. Um, uh, and I remember thinking, oh my god, I'm so proud of 100 people. And I mean, now, I mean, how embarrassing. Okay, cool, 100. But, but at the time, it seemed like a huge milestone. Uh, and then we scaled this product data to 1,000 before we launched TechCrunch and opened it up to everybody else. So we had a lot of things worked out. And it was kind of in a cover, and it was, you know, early customers were really willing to give a lot of feedback. So that worked well for us, which was kind of our version of a pilot program. And virality, I, the way I think about this is, are you getting, in an ideal scenario, people coming to you because they're searching for solutions to solve a problem that you're focused on, or and or uh, you have customers of yours that are so happy that are telling other people in their space or you know, peers of theirs, this is a product that uh, you should be looking at. I find that virality can be even stronger in industry-focused solutions. So I give you an example of Viva Systems, a uh, pretty special company in the life sciences space. Uh, their initial focus was the 20 largest pharma companies. Uh, they initially got Pfizer as a customer. Their whole company was focused on getting Pfizer as a customer. Once they got Pfizer as a customer, Pfizer 
called you know a few other pharma companies in the space and said you know this is the right solution to be solving this problem and, and they ended up not having to spend much money in sales and marketing because the word of mouth just spread in those 20 companies. There are, there are some industry focused solutions where your total population of potential customers in the tens of thousands and then that's harder to get that virality but ideally you have people talking about you within the industry or people talking to you across a functional area that you know is considered your buyer. This is a pretty special place to get into to you know know you're on something and to get um, some sales and marketing leverage. So, Shell, how did you rate yourself at the year round? We were the last one. We had a lot of work. for a security service and a performance service for plumbing management. We had a pretty high word about which we didn't understand. Um, and I, I think it goes back to because we were building a product that solved a real problem in a segment of the market where there were not good options. So I think a lot of this comes back to what problem you're solving. I, there's a lot less of this if you're one of the five companies at GE trying to compete for their budget. Because there's four other really good options at the same size. So if you could find a segment of the market where there's not a lot of competition for whatever reason and and, and find a way to gain a lot of traction and do some really smart things, you can build a really big business and customers will help with this. So early on we had a ton of morality and we still do. I mean we are now until January 1st this year, we had four people on our marketing team. I mean, which is, we were six years old and then no one knew marketing at Cloudflare. Um, and so now we're building a marketing organization because I truly believe that if we get marketing right, we should invest in it. It will change our growth curve going forward. And so now we're trying to do more of the outbound side and, and, and more of the programs and spend around marketing because it's just, word of mouth is really not great, but once you have a business and you have traction and word of mouth, then you want to be able to figure out how do you spend a dollar to make, you know, the three dollars. Um, and then really where your business 